Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Hi, everyone. Member of Parliament Garna Jenis here, your host of the Resuming Debate podcast. It's great to be back for another episode. And uh, we're going to have a conversation today about the issue of supply chain slavery. Uh, the fact that products you buy uh, may have been made uh, through a process involving uh, slave or, or uh, forced labor in other parts of the world, and then those products being imported into Canada. Supply chains can be very complex. So what is a morally clear-cut issue? Nobody wants to, in principle, be complicit in uh, in in using products that are made through slave labor or financially supporting the oppression of other people, it can be challenging to disentangle what products came from where and to uh, unroll these supply chains to prevent uh, to prevent products from being imported into Canada. Uh, and I've, I've been one of the people saying that Canada has been behind in addressing these issues and in trying to step up and stop the import of these uh, products. But there has been a lot of momentum in this parliament around the issue of, uh, of uh, supply chain slavery. Uh, there have been a number of different legislative proposals from, uh, from, from different voices in, in the House and the Senate and, and different parties. And all of the parties have said in principle that they want to move forward on this. They re recognize that there are some significant gaps. So is this an opportunity for uh, cross-party collaboration? Uh, is the devil in the details here? Uh, what can we do to, um, to, to protect ourselves from being complicit in, in injustice by buying products that are, that are supporting slave labor? And, and how could we take a stand for uh, the, the most vulnerable and oppressed around the world? Uh, joining me to talk about this are... Uh, senator Leo Husakos uh, and uh, a conservative senator and uh, the sponsor of, of well, one of the many bills we're seeing on this issue and a, a friend of this podcast, a re repeat guest sucker for, for punishment here, uh, <laughs> liberal MP uh, John McKay, uh, who, um, who is sponsoring in the House a Senate bill uh, from Senator Duchesne uh that is that is also on the issue so so uh the, these uh, both great to have both of you here uh working on kind of a couple different bills on this issue for for a good conversation about about uh this this important and complex issue that's great happy to be here again garnet um apparently i have very low standards but um um yeah. I'm, uh, i am happy to to be here and this is an important topic to talk about we just couldn't get anyone else, John. I mean, <laughs> I know. I, know. It's, it's, yeah. I feel badly for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and so, uh, Leo, since you're 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 new to the podcast here, why don't you uh, kick us off here? And um, I think maybe a good place to start is kind of just a a political look at at the dynamics on this issue. Um, it seems that there's been a kind of coming together of awareness and desire for action here. Um, what do you see as as the origin of that? And um, and and uh, how can we seize that momentum to actually make sure we're achieving results? Arnett, thanks uh, for having me uh, on the show and good to be on the show with my friend John, uh, John McKay. Uh, look, this is an important issue and, and thank you uh, both for your advocacy on this. And it's great to see parliamentarians from all parties in both our chambers coming together uh, to address uh, the issue. Um, I think we need to continue to sensitize Canadians. It is always shocking to me when I speak to uh, stakeholders across the country, uh, how they are oblivious sometimes to what is going on around the world. We live in a, in, in a world where information is so readily available, so fluid, but yet we are so self-consumed with our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so we, we go to the stores, we go to Walmart and we pick up a shirt or we, we go to the Nike outlet and we we buy a pair of shoes and uh, for our main preoccupation is, you know, how, how low a price can we get, uh, how um, self-concerned consumed we are uh, with our own interests without understanding where those products come from. So um, I, I compliments the Senator Emilville Duchesne for, for S211. I think it's a, it's a good step forward. I also have a bill S204, which is calling on all products from Xinjiang to be banned into Canada. Uh, and uh, hopefully John will take on that bill as well in the house and, and promote it through. I think these are just small steps. Uh, we need to have parliamentarians unite on this issue and we need to get the political will from the government on this issue. 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, the two bills, your, your bill S204, Senator Duchesne's bill S211, uh, come at this from two, two different angles. S211 uh, is about uh, reporting requirements for companies, and S204 is about recognizing the, the particular vulnerability of, of Uyghurs in terms of, of high levels of forced labor we know are, are impacting Uyghurs. Um, so, John, why don't you, you talk a little bit about S211? I, I think it's, it's a bill with, with wide support. Um, there have been some critics who say it doesn't go far enough, um, which I think, you know, I mean, there's, there's always more that can be done. But tell us about S211 and, and why you think it's important and effective. Well, let me go back to the issue of uh, why now. Um, so after four years, uh, this bill appears to be an overnight success because the, the vote in the House was 327 to zero. You know, seldom see that on a on a bill of any kind, really. Um, so uh, we we've introduced versions of this bill in previous parliaments, not gone anywhere for a variety of reasons. Um, and then in the last election, uh, both major parties, the Liberals and Conservatives, um, had it in their platform. So that's an indication that uh, the message is actually getting through. And um, then with the uh, pandemic and the consequences of the pandemic, people really started to uh, consider about uh, supply chains in general, whether it came from a, a reshoring or a nearshoring or uh, whatever, the, the vulnerabilities in supply chains actually came to the forefront of people's minds. And they realized that sometimes our supply chains are stretched way too long and sometimes uh, when you start to look at those supply chains, there's some very dubious sources of labor and goods in those supply chains. And so uh, it's kind of an interesting way in which uh, the politics, which up until recently had been a bit of a, a fight, um, are no longer or not nearly as much a, a conflict as, as before. So the bill that came out of the Senate, um, and Leo would be able to speak to this as to whether uh, the, the vote was um, unanimous as well, um, but uh, I know it, it got a very um, uh, favorable um, exercise in the, um, in the committee hearings. Uh, the, the testimony was quite positive. Um, so the bill is simply a reporting bill that uh, Canadian companies and governments would be obligated to uh, examine their supply chains on an annual basis and um, certify to the Minister of Public Safety that they are satisfied that they... Uh, uh, have uh, examined the supply chains and um, and uh, have, uh, insofar as possible, uh, gotten rid of the, any uh, slave labor in the supply chains, and also have taken some, whatever steps they need to take in order to be able to um, uh, to clean up uh, their supply chains. So I, I, it's it's starting at a relatively low level of obligation, and it'll ramp up and ramp up. And um, the statements we are expecting. Uh, chief executives and uh, chief financial officers to sign are in the court in, in, in a parallel or a similar to uh, what you would sign when you are um, presenting your financial statements to your auditor um, with, with consequences, real consequences. And, uh, and if there is a fine um, that is associated with uh, the statement, if it's a, a false statement or you fail to file, um, and there are, uh, there's also uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a naming and shaming, which I think is actually far greater consequence to a lot of companies um, that don't want to see their names um, spread all over the newspapers of uh, failing to, uh, failing to uh, comply or fi uh, filing false statements or things of that nature. It will have significant uh, consumer implications, but it also has cons uh, uh, significant um, financial implications. And one of the arguments that gets made, and you alluded to it, Garnet, was that this is a moral argument. Uh, nobody wants to be buying slave products, um, certainly not knowingly. And, and certainly this bill speaks to that, but it's also an economic argument. Uh, uh, our workers in Canada, our share, our, our companies in Canada can't compete with slaves, just can't do it. Um, and so we are actually um, cutting off our noses to spite our faces if in fact we, we don't uh, deal with this issue. And as Leo's bill addresses, uh, there, is, there are specific areas uh, that uh, we've got a reasonable uh, there's a reasonable prospect that the product that um, 
is coming out of that area is um, is infected with with uh, slavery in some manner or another. Um, our bill is a bit uh, wider in scope and uh, would touch more products from various parts of the world. And so uh, uh, it's it's you know you also raise the issue of uh, well does it go far enough? Well, there's never any bill that goes far enough. Uh, however, um, I think um, this is a huge uh, leap forward uh, as far as um, as far as becoming parallel or at least having similar legislation to our G7 partners and maybe G20 partners. None of our uh, trading partners want to be competing with a country that allows slavery to be part of their supply chain because it's difficult for them to compete. So this is actually a a live issue in our negotiations with the with the UK. So um, there's the uh, the cheap and cheerful summary of the bill and the issues, uh, the political issues as I see them, and um, and I also see that um, Senator Mivane Deshane has uh, joined us. So Julie, welcome to Garnet's podcast. Thank you. John's been on so many times. He uh, he feels like a host now. We're gonna have to yeah. we're gonna have to co-host it or something. Well, that, uh, that, would, that would be very strange, Garrett. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had I had wondered about doing one with Nader Skin Smith. We could call it the Joint Podcast. But uh, um, when, anyway, when he anyways, talks about joints, he's talking about something else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Julie, thank you so much for joining us. So we're 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 rolling now, and I'm I'm sorry we started recording before you got here, just because I think there was a bit of a, a confusion in the communication in terms of of. A few things, but but I'm anyways. I'm I'm so glad you're here. John just gave a great uh, kind of summary of, of your bill, and uh, one of the points he made um, I think is interesting is about how, in the context of COVID, there has been increased awareness about the issue of supply chains in general, and uh, it's been about human rights as well as about security. And I, I tend to think there's a unity between these these concepts, and that, and that it's it's no surprise that countries that are abusing the human rights of their people also uh, present security threats to their neighbors. If you're, if you're uh, terrible to your own people, you're probably going to be terrible to people outside your borders as well. And if you are respecting the rule of law uh, domestically, you're probably going to be more likely to, uh, to respect it internationally. But in the area of supply chains, um, we've got these issues of, uh, of if, if, if products are, are made in countries where there's these human rights violations, uh, then, then also there's a risk that, that uh, uh, those, those same countries will arbitrarily cut off supply for strategic reasons uh, or try mm-hmm. to, to leverage their position in other ways. Um, so I'd, I'd love if you can come in on, on that specific issue and, um, and uh, then also um, maybe a follow-up question on S211. It's about a reporting framework, right? So I guess one of the questions is what happens if a company just says, yeah, we're using slave labor and uh and buy our products or not technically in this bill the assumption is that won't happen that the, that the mm-hmm. sort of moral sweep but but technically a company is allowed to just say yeah we're doing nothing we're buying slave products and if you don't like it too bad so many question packed here thank you for having me um when you said my bill yes my name is on the bill but i have to say since the beginning i've been working with uh, john mckay because it was first his bill in 2018 so this is a great example of collaboration between mps senators and and all party to be frank because i had also the support of uh, of all the other parties including the conservative party so um the first question the easiest is what happened when the company says uh, i'm using slave labor well, I don't think it's going to happen because obviously we know that this is a reporting requirement. Um, it's, not, it's not getting rid of slave labor and child labor in six months. But at the same time, companies live through their reputation. So imagine a report that would be used by the human rights group that would be uh, publicized of a company who says, yes, I use slave labor and I intend to do nothing about it. So I don't think this is what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that we're going to have probably uh, some reports at the beginning that are uh, quite uh, weak that uh, because because companies will have to, to, to get used to it. 
And it will be a question of governance and of question for them of, of not only reputation uh, for consumers, but also for investors, because more and more investors don't want to be uh, to take the risk of being associated with a company that has slave labor and, and child labor and, and journalism exists. Uh, we know about the Uyghur now very well, but there's other situation. So, so no, it's not the end of modern slavery, S211, but it's the beginning of a process in our companies, in our government, to be more serious about detecting forced labor and about finding solution. Because the solution, Garrett, is not always to say, let's get rid of this particular company and choose another one. It can be also to try to, to, to convince this particular company that if they want to, to keep their business, they have to clean up uh, their, their workforce. And, and so, so that's also what, what, uh, what can be done. Um, your other more complicated question, um, yes, there are absolutely links uh, between uh, uh, countries that do not respect human rights and, and, and forced labor, and we see that in China, absolutely. But I would say forced labor and particularly child labor is also linked to poverty, to, to lack of security in general. So, you know, there's a reason why children are in mines in Africa. It's because their family uh, are sending them there because they want money, because uh, they want to, 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 to survive. They need food. So, so obviously, when we tackle uh, child labor and, and slave labor through what we are doing, we, we are not tackling the larger issue of poverty and of inequality in the world. And I know I will sound idealistic, but, but this has to be done too. Uh, poverty is a great, great reason for continuation of child labor. Uh, and, and, and so we need to do better as rich country um, on that too. So, so yeah, that's, that's a great point and, and picking up on that because I, it, it is a challenging one with, with uh, this legislation in terms of thinking about families that are in that very difficult situation of, of saying, you know, we, we want our kids to be able to not work and go to school. Um, we're also in a situation of desperate poverty. And um, um, the ideal, of course, is that they not be in that situation. Given that situation, um, what would you what would you say? And, and maybe you've had these opportunities to have conversations with with people in, in these in these countries who are in these situations. Uh, about those who are concerned, what's what's the impact for their ability to to as a family supplement their their livelihood? Well, I think eventually, not only the the companies that are deciding to have better uh, uh, work conditions and not to use, and we're not speaking here about what con work conditions, but violation of human rights, but those companies have to, at this point, uh, proactively try to, to do something in, in, um, in um, cooperation with the groups on the ground, with the NGOs, to try to make sure that this particular child who was uh, working can go to school, either by a grant, either by helping the family. So there is, I find myself, a moral responsibility for companies to act. And also, you know, don't forget, in all those countries, there are groups that are um, uh, involved, uh, human rights groups and, and groups uh, uh, against poverty. So the civil society can, can also help. But it's true that there's a danger if we cut um, children from jobs, will they go further down in, in, in darker places than they were already? Uh, we are conscious of all that. So I have to say there has been an amendment uh, to S211 uh, that my um, uh, colleague uh, Armina Gerba, who's uh, originally from Cameroon, Cameroon and who has been a child herself working, mm. did, did put into that, that uh, particular bill. And it's, it's a great amendment. It says um, in the different things that companies have to do, they have to think about the aftermath of what they're mm. doing. Uh, so, you know, obviously uh, 
we, we won't be able to verify all that, but it's part of this long process because nothing will happen overnight. It's a long process of responsabilization uh, about you know what we consume and how it's done and who's who's paying the price. Yeah. The, the other way I would answer that question, uh, Garnet, is if it becomes known that um, um, the product that is infected with supply chain slavery um, is no longer a saleable product and that that purchasers of that product are um, one way or another, whether it's because of the le legislation or for other reasons whatsoever, are switching, uh, if you will, supply chain lines. Um, I dare say that that will have a salutary effect on on uh, those who are trapped uh, that the people that Julia is talking about um, because if I'm you know I, I can't particularly pick an example um, but if three or four steps down the line there is a clear indication of slavery and and we'll say that the ultimate product uh, the purchaser of the product is a Canadian company with a, a reputation that it wants to protect uh, not only for the purposes of its customers and not only for the purpose of its own morality, but not only for the purposes of its its financing and its shareholders. Um, and they say, well, we simply cannot buy your product. Um, that's going to that's gonna change things. I hope it changes for the better. I'm not so naive as to think that other issues might not arise, but um, uh, that, that will be a happy outcome of the bill and it will yeah. not necessarily be realized immediately. I'm going to bring Leo in to, to talk about his bill in, in a minute, but just to, to respond quickly, I mean, I think there's a couple of points in, in what you said that are that are really important. One is just, you know, in terms of the, the, the legislative process, a lot of what we do uh, isn't to pretend that we can solve a problem in one bill, uh, but sometimes we have these bills that plant a seed, that expose information, uh, and we fully expect them to kind of work their way out through time. Um, you know, and, and you're talking about that. You're talking about how, look, it, you, you expect at first thing, certain things to happen and then there to be kind of a building momentum around it. Um, uh, but and, also, and I, this is yeah. what I believe strongly. Yeah. I've been explaining that for two years, Garnet, that my, the bill, our bill, is a first step. And, and that's how we see it. You know, I, I'm learning compromise as a, as a, <laughs> as a, a MP, as a senator, uh, which is a journalist I, I was not inclined to do. You know, I just had to report reality. But legislation is about what's possible, what's feasible, how you change mentalities. And I think we're late on the game in Canada. We're starting after others, but we have to have companies take, you know, understand what's happening, do their, their due diligence. And all of that cannot, you know, can be done very quickly in very big enterprise where they already have lots of people um, checking things and governing. But, you know, I'm in the bill, it's, it's for the companies of 40 million and plus in terms of, of, um, uh, of revenues. And, and some of them don't have, you know, all, all the expertise to do that quickly. So, so we have to, 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 to be a little bit patient, not too much, but a little bit patient for, to, to have this, this new mentality that this is as important as, you, as your financial statements. But, but okay. um, just before you bring in Leo uh, Garnet, I, I'll give you a little anecdote, um, an anticipated anecdote. My daughter works for one of those companies. My daughter is charged with the responsibility of implementing this bill. And she has, of course, got pushback from the senior executives or even middle executives saying, well, we can't do this, we can't do this. And ironically, uh, Rachel is saying to them, look, you either uh, get, get our supply chains cleaned up and examine so that we can sign these statements or the government will do it for you. And so already the bill is having impact on large responsible companies. And I won't name her company just because it would embarrass her, but uh, uh, so, it's, it's an interesting consequence. Yeah, so there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of different kinds of situations we're talking about. We talk about, about the, 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 the child 
labor related to poverty situation. Um, you know, and, and there's, there's, there's different kinds of, of, of situations. Um, Leo, if there's anything you want to pick up on, on the discussion, but I mainly want to hear, you know, cause, cause your bill is, is in a, in a way more targeted, right? It, it's, it's saying there's a specific situation of very acute forced labor. It's not, it's not about uh, um, kind of the, you know it's 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 very specific and it's state driven this oppression. Um, maybe you can speak to the importance of having a, a regional approach as well and well, how that interacts before, with this other approach. Before, uh, before I get into my bill, and, and you're right, it is a lot more uh, unequivocal. I, I want to comment a little bit on my colleague's uh, perspective, and of course, you know, I support S two eleven. As I mentioned at the outset of this uh, podcast, it's it's. Uh, one small step uh, of many steps, parliamentary steps that we've been trying to, to take in order to, to garner attention to this issue. The truth of the matter is uh, I've been around parliament now a little bit longer than two years and my patients are coming out. Uh, I think that uh, we need to do a lot more than just uh, veil general statements and small baby steps. I think we need to get the political will, not behind just our government, but the Western world, the G7, uh, to, to put an end to what is, without a doubt, uh, a corporate addiction to slave labor around the world, particularly in China, in pursuit of profits. And I agree with John. We've been patient in trying to name and shame corporations and to use persuasion and to educate consumers. Clearly, it, isn't, it hasn't been working, either because the media hasn't also been helpful in this. Uh, Julie in her previous life was in the media. I'm not particularly pleased. Uh, I find it a gargantuan effort to garner attention from your, your past colleagues when it comes to reporting to issues of this nature. And it's always beyond my understanding of why some of these outlets refuse to shed light and help uh, deal with the issue. Um, the other element is that we have a custom tariff act on the books now for a couple of years, a very rigid one. We have elements of Kuzma and, and NAFTA before that, which made it, une- made it clear that our governments were supposed to take action against products that use slave labor. Uh, and that is both in the United States and Canada. And yet, if we look at the application of the custom tariff act in the last almost two years, nothing but kiss has been done. And it hasn't been done for a variety of reasons because the tools aren't there for CBSA. They've been the first to highlight that they have they don't have the tools and the capacity or the political mandate to take action. There's been one container that was detained over the last two years, and that container after 35 days was released. So clearly we know these things are happening in the supply chain around the world. And yet we still have not taken any concrete action in preventing these products coming into the marketplace. So that's a good segue into my bill. And that's why I believe S204 is a lot more unequivocal. I consider that also a small step because the truth of the matter is, I believe at least the regional attempt is knowing that in a place like Xinjiang, where parliament has recognized there's a genocide going on, we've recognized there's concentration camps and labor camps where products are being used by companies like Nike, and I will call them out, and other corporations that are using cotton in the garment industry from the Xinjiang region. And we know full well that we're using slave labor of Uyghur Muslims in those areas to produce these products, yet we continue to bring them into the country. So my bill, S204, is calling for a ban of all products coming in from Xinjiang. Uh, Yes, it's unequivocal. And of course, it bears the question that after that, which is, Very often, cotton will be picked in Xinjiang, but yet the cotton will be shipped in other regions of China and manufactured. And yet, and then what do you do? Well, I've I've been a little bit extreme on this, but I've said for a long time that we have to review and revisit our relationship with a country like China, which is using all kinds of dubious uh, methods in order to produce products and to ship into the West. Uh, and other nefarious behavior in terms of human rights in Hong Kong and Taiwan and against the people of Tibet. So, um, look, I I support S211 as a baby step. I think S204 is a teenage step, if you want, but we need to get the political will of the Western world 
to take more concrete action and reshaping our relationship. And John is right. We would never tolerate slave labor. We wouldn't tolerate the standards when it comes to the environmental standards and other uh, elements and human rights standards in China and our country. So why do we tolerate their products coming in to our yeah, country? Thank Th th thanks, Leo. I I'm just going to go to John now because I um I know he's he's got a he's got a just at the time we're recording he's got a hard stop and maybe we'll continue the conversation a little bit uh, after he leaves. Um, John, uh, uh, Ju Julie's an independent and Leo's a conservative, but you're you're the only one here who sits in the government caucus. Uh, you you're someone who's also willing to disagree with the government on on certain things from time to time. But how <laughs> how you know re responding to Leo's comments? How do you rate the performance of uh, of the government that you are? Um, I guess in some sense a part of. I mean, you're you know yeah, not very good. What, I mean, with, I, okay. I mean, there's no there's no shilly shallying around here. Uh, Leo's right to point it out that we've received we've seized one. Um, shipment in what two or three years since uh we entered into kuzma uh the american john if i can cut you it's not a unique problem to this government it's been no, successful no no, no i we have lots of company in our hypocrisies um uh, so and that and that shipment i think was um uh, was challenged by the um uh, by the um, owners lawyers and ultimately got it back so we're zero um I, um, as far as government support, I was very pleased with the relevant minister. Well, first of all, let me start with the fact that uh, the prime minister put uh, supply chain uh, slave issues into four mandate letters. Uh, the lead minister on this is Seamus O'Regan, uh, minister of labor. And, um, and I was very pleased that when uh, the bill was being debated, he sat beside me. Um, and um, and uh, his very presence uh, and the presence of a number of members of our caucus while the bill was being debated um, uh, gave, gave me a comfort and an indication that the government is behind this bill um, and may actually come forward with with amendments that will be um, even make the bill even stronger. I've yet to see that, but um, I, I live in hope, shall we say. Um, so I'm. Uh, I think that uh, you know we may not have taken any steps for a while, but we may be actually taking a, a much larger step um, than than the bill itself. We'll see. Um, it, go ahead. In, ter in terms of those mandate letter commitments, uh, though, is is your sense that the government is going to support this bill and then say our work is done, or uh, are or, or is your sense that they're going to support the bill but also bring forward? Uh, the the, legis the the government legislation that they had talked about doing previously. Um, uh, I haven't got a clear answer to that. Okay. Um, the uh, the um, conversations uh, have been we only want to make the bill stronger, so there's no indication that uh, they want to have a, have their own bill, if you will. Um, and I I wouldn't uh, I'd be very skeptical about their own bill because it's so difficult to get um, time on the floor. Uh, to do to do legislation, as you well know, so um, might as well ride the pony that you got, as opposed to the pony you might like to have. And um, so S two eleven is the pony that that we've got. And if in fact we can um, get get acceptable amendments, um, then I will be back to um, to Julie <laughs> with with the bill and asking her to uh, get her and Leo and their colleagues to um, accept the amendments. But uh, uh, we, I have yet to get a definitive answer on that. Um, I'm anticipating that that will be coming forward fairly shortly, but I'm, uh, it's, it's a heck of a lot better position to be in uh, where you're working with the government as opposed to other bills where I've been working against the government. It's a lot easier, let me tell you. So, I, I can say from an opposition perspective, working against the government is a lot of fun and, uh, you know, you should do it as much as you can. Oh, I, I, I've, I've been there, done that. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yes. And I have the, I have the uh, defeats uh, um, on my yeah. um, resume to show for it. Yeah. No, I'm, so, I'm, I'm kidding. Of course, we want to work together whenever, whenever we can, right? While while fiercely uh well if you could get your, your committee to right uh, stop filibustering them we might be able to get our bill in front of the committee yeah i uh i am keen for us to adjourn debate on the matter currently before us so we can get uh, get down to business 
but oh, let's, let's, I, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to leave uh, again. Thank you for doing this. <laughs> Mike, Mike drop from John McKay, everybody. Uh, and uh, thanks so much, John, for, for being on again. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation okay. here though. So, so uh, I'll go to Senator uh, Duchesne now. Uh, Julie, you were going to follow up on a couple of the points that were made. So, so please take it yes. away. Yes, I always like to answer uh, Leo because we're debating a lot in the Senate. But first, let me tell you that, uh, like uh, John, uh, I'm very encouraged by the fact that the minister said publicly that he wants a stronger bill. So they will have amendments to make it stronger. I have nothing against it. You know, I, I went with the bill that I thought I could I could have consensus on in the Senate and I wanted to, to pass. So that's what I did. But I would absolutely uh, approve of, of making the bill stronger, as they will suggest, because obviously this is a transparency bill. And a transparency bill is a first step, but there are other steps. Um, I also want to say that I supported um, Leo's bill um, in second reading. I've uh, proposed a few changes because, um, you know, there could be problem in, in completely banning products from a region without giving any right of appeal to the uh, importer. So this could be uh, strengthened a bit. So we would respect our international engagements. And I would uh, not agree with Leo on the fact that the press has been completely muted on the topic. I, I, you know, I won't speak for over 20 years, but there has been some strong research by Marketplace at CBC, some research at La Presse in Quebec. So, so during the pandemic and maybe you know, in the last months, I would say there has been some, some quite strong investigating reporting. It's not enough, you're right. You know, I read The Guardian, uh, from the UK, where there's much more on the issue, uh, but but it's not empty. It's not an empty space, I would say. But I'm defending my old uh, profession. Um, th th thanks for that. So so Leo, just for for your response, let's start on the provisions of the bill itself. Um, your bill is a complete ban, if I understand it, on products from Xinjiang or East Turkestan. That is a bit different from the. Uh, the American uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which uh, which does involve a particular designation for that region, but it does so with a reverse onus, right? It says it says that if you can prove that your product does not use slave labor, then you can import from there. But the reverse onus, you have to prove prove that there that you're not using child labor and it's and it's excluded by default. Um, why did you uh, decide to pursue the approach you did as opposed to the the approach taken in the United States? And what do you think of uh, what Julie's saying about amendments? The problem, and we all fall into this trap, and this trap serves the interests of large corporations that want to continue to do business. They live off profits and they benefit from slave labor. It's very simple. The Chinese are specialists in providing you products that seem like a particular product, but isn't that product. So it is, it is nearly impossible. And if you listen to senior officials at CBSA, there are absolutely, it makes it impossible for, for Canadian officials to be able to determine when the Chinese are using all kinds of dubious methodologies in the supply chain to get around the problem as we currently know they're doing. They're taking the cotton, they're shipping it to other regions and they're transforming it in other regions. And then they're shipping it with labels and we never know where that cotton comes from. So as long as we keep falling into that trap that we give the opportunity and the, the, the onus of, of, of the proof is, is on us when we know that the vast majority of products that are coming from China are coming under labor conditions that we would never accept in our country, in all regions of the country, that is the weak point where we fall on, we, we sort of fall on the asleep on the job. We will never get it done. So in pursuit of, 4% of our trading uh, exchange with China, we, we sell down the river our values and principles, and we continue to allow millions of people, men, women, and children, suffering in slave labor camps. I think it's a cop-out. I, I know it appeases certain uh, NGO, uh, you know, um, groups and, and um, stakeholders, but, but it's it a bit job. Couldn't you say that, um, uh, Leo, for so many other countries where we don't know exactly uh, 
if if that slave labor is in this particular country. So so so, uh, I understand you're focusing on China because you're right. You know, we had you know it was declared a genocide, a genocide, and all that. But you know, what the only thing we're asking him is here is to give the the, the importers or, or the possibility of proving that it's not modern slavery or, or forced labor. This is difficult to do. So it's a very difficult proof. And they, if they cannot do it, yes, the shipment will be stopped. It's just a question of, of, of being, you know, I understand what you're saying. You know, it's been going on for years, but at the same time, China is certainly not the only culprit. Uh, there, there are other regions of the world. And again, the reason why I'm picking on Xinjiang is because there is no doubt it's going on there. So why should we open the door for, for negotiation with a region of, of the world where we know without an inkling of the doubt, the evidence is so transparent. And if we're willing to allow that there, imagine all the other regions of the world where you're absolutely right, the, the jury's still out. And I'm, that's why I'm not listing those other countries or those other regions. So if we're not willing to put our foot down in the area where we know unequivocally it's 100% going on, Obviously, the rest of the countries in the world and the rest of the regions in Africa and other parts in, in South Asia, I'm not, we're, not, we're not even debating those. They're not even on the radar. And I reinforce my argument. NAFTA, CUSMA, the Custom Tariff Act, absolutely zero impact. There has been no political will on the government. And I am sorry, I'm not convinced that um, CBSA and the ministers involved and re responsible are willing to ha have the political will to put their foot down. That's why they're embracing a law that is so flexible. It's so elastic that it will well, continue. I have, I have the same. I have the same criticism as you, as you know, on the borders nope. and on the fact we're not arresting enough shipments. That this that there should be more, either more money, more expertise, whatever it's needed. And I think it's also our privacy laws that are at stake because, believe it or not, but when we arrest. Uh, a shipment, we don't say who uh, is importing and we don't name right. the company. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, I am sorry, but the whole idea to change, uh, to change uh, the, the industry the company's uh, behavior, you have to say publicly, this is a company that could have uh, a shipment with forced labor. And if we hide everything, uh, well, I think there's a problem there too. Yeah, I think I understand sort of the, the fault lines in this in this conversation. It's an interesting one. I mean, clearly you're both you're both very engaged on these issues. The the point Leo is making is if we have an airtight ban, then there's no wiggle room, and you know there's there's nothing coming in. Um, what you're saying, uh, Julie, is that there's um, that if if you establish that high bar that they can that they can prove the negative. That, that they're not using child labor. I mean, one, one wonders, I mean, uh, if, that, if, that would even, if that would even be used or how frequently it would be used that someone would be selling us products from East Turkestan or, or Xinjiang uh, that, that did not involve uh, child labor where they could in fact verify that that was, that, uh, that was the case. Nonetheless, it, 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 it provides, it provides a, 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 a wiggle room that, that is in principle just, I mean, if you can prove that you're not using child labor, why not? But I think, I guess Leo's concern is if you provide that wiggle room, it, it's, it will be abused. So I guess a lot of this comes back to the question of adjudication and enforcement, right? Uh, so we need to step up the adjudication and the enforcement function here um, so that we're, we're doing a better job of identifying the problems and and responding it, here it's it's not easy but we also have you know the GATT uh commerce agreements um and and canada has to kind of uh respect the spirit of that right uh, so that's why you know this this appeal process you know brings in the fact that by doing that we would respect some of our engagements yeah let me wrap up with this question to both of you and it's sort of the uh, maybe a, an underlying question about activism, uh, political work on this and other issues. I, I get the sense that there's there's some disagreement among people that uh, you two and, and John as well, uh, just just diff different different points of emphasis on the issue of sort of patience in in activism, right? Um, that that to be uh, to advocate for justice and human rights 
on one level, we should be impatient. Uh, that is, we should be be demanding that we move as quickly as possible, and we should be uh, be tired of, of of waiting, right? But on the other hand, the sustained work of making a change, re- even as fast as possible, requires strategic patience. It requires a willingness not to not to get too frustrated to be able to say, okay, the most effective way to get where we need to go is by uh, sometimes it is by planting seeds. Um, but but, it's, it's, but we can it's also do both, right? It's a great also, debate. It's a great yeah. debate. I've been thinking about that since I've been a senator since four years and I'm an extremely impatient woman. Uh, that's probably why I was a good journalist because I, I didn't wait. Yeah. I, I, tried, I tried to report on everything. And as, as a senator, I've learned patience. Maybe have I become too patient? Um, senator Zekos may have an opinion on that, but it has permitted me to retable uh, three times um, S211 because there was a prorogation, because there was an elections. So this was for me completely, uh, it made no sense to have to, to start again the the job three times in a row, you know, obviously it gave me time to understand what I was doing, to meet people and all that. But but legislative work is 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 long. But at the same time, you know, where I think I would uh, join Leo is is not to use um, a parliamentary uh, slowness as an excuse not to try to be bold. And and obviously I'm on my learning curve now. But I don't think we can sit there and just say it's impossible, it's going to take too long. We have to try to change things that we think we can change. And I'm still there. It's just that I don't have a lot of year of experience and, and, and I'm trying to learn. Leo, what's your, your take on this issue of, of patience and impatience in, in the pursuit of justice? Look, I understand. I, I'm in agreement with Senator Ismail Bill Duchesne, and, and I've been a parliamentarian now for a while, and uh, and I believe that parliament and government work, you know, moves in millimeters, and you have to be patient. But there has to be a willingness to move. Right now, the truth of the matter is I've been at this for 13 years as a senator, and the yardsticks have not moved. So my view is uh, we need action, and we need action now. I, I will support the continuous um pursuit of, of moving the yardsticks from a parliamentary point of view, but follow the money. And my concern right now is that China is a nation that has uh, infiltrated a lot of our institutions. Uh, we've seen it uh, in terms of uh, our democratic institutions. We've seen former senior ministers who leave public life and end up on you know, comfortable retainers representing uh, Chinese organization and agencies. Now we see Canadian public service funds that are investing gargantuan amounts of money into these corporations in China, which we know are supporting, again, supply chain, slave labor. So the problem is getting progressively worse from the perch where I'm standing, uh, Garnet, and you've been a parliamentarian now for quite a while. And I think that it's nice to go to protests. It's nice to have these, these pieces of legislation from the House and the Senate but we need the political will uh, to take action and get the job done. And I'm just afraid in the last few years with what happened to the two Michaels uh, and uh, what's going on in Hong Kong, what's going on with the pressure on Taiwan, that we're actually taking a step back in terms of dealing with China rather than moving the yardsticks forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Great, great conversation. Yeah, and- I still have hope. I just want to say yeah. I still have hope. I need to yeah. have hope because otherwise yeah. you don't survive in that institution. Yeah. What's your point? You're, you're the host here. But- yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, so, so here's, my, here, here's, here, here, here's, here's what I would say, right? Like, like we, we have to be patient because what else do you have when you, when you fail to move things? I mean, we should, we should, we should want to move things forward quickly, uh, but but as quickly as possible sometimes means having the, the like patience is the only way to maintain your, your peace of mind. Right. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm reading um, um, a team of rivals about uh, this, this great kind of uh, biography of Abraham Lincoln in, intersecting with other, other members of his cabinet. And um, in the face of, 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 of ongoing slavery, the sort of ways in which they engaged in politics. And it was the same situation we're dealing with today, right? Except that we don't, we don't see it as directly because it's, it's not in our own country. But, um, but for Lincoln, like the, um, 
if, you know, in a, in a way, I think some might might judge him and his his cohorts for not being extreme enough in their in their abolitionist zeal. They were, you know, initially saying, "Well, we're we're not we're, we just want to prevent the expansion of slavery." Like, um, but but in a way, this this was um, they were they were working within the confines of the of the parameters of the politics as as, as it was. And um, but but I, I also just think in this discussion about supply chain slavery. Uh, I should, we should underline, we're talking about a few different things at once, right? We're talking about the issue of, of children that are working in potentially dangerous situations uh, coming out of poverty. And so in, that, in those situations, you, you want to push the companies to improve conditions and to, um, and to, make, and to make improvements, right? Uh, and, then, and then you have circumstances uh, like like Leo's or, talking or to about. hire or to hire an adult instead of a child yes, yes. to do this it, job, you know, it, it, exactly. Right. And to, and to, yeah. So, so um, there are, there are, and you have to think about underlying causes of, of poverty and security. And, um, but then you also have the case of, of uh, what's happening in, in China where you have a, a state policy of, of forced labor involving a, uh, an ethnic minority, and that's in that case, the cause isn't poverty. The cause is is violence um, by the state that is that is forcing people into this situation, and and so um, and so there's there's my, my instinct is that, and and we're talking about a couple different bills here, right? My instinct is that 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 you need to have a response to these different different issues in the supply chain. S two eleven uh, helps address all of them. Um, uh, Leo's is a is a sharper approach to that that one particular issue of what's happening in China. Um, so I just think it's it's good for the conversation to acknowledge that, that yeah there are there are different kinds of problems in our supply chains and we're we're in this political moment and it's good where more people are thinking about and talking about supply chains where are our products coming from and what are they contributing to through them. Um, and and it's probably going to be a few different bills, a few different kinds of solutions, uh, and and on different time horizons that are going to move forward. Um, I'll, I'll give you both kind of the last word, and then and then we'll wrap up. Thanks so much again for doing this. So maybe we'll go uh, um, we'll go Leo first, and then Julie, and then uh, and then wrap up. Anything else you want to add to the conversation? Garnet, thanks for uh, the opportunity of uh, having us on your podcast. These are important issues, but I want to particularly thank you, Garnet, for your advocacy and your work. You're a fantastic parliamentarian and you're a very principled fellow. I'm privileged to work with you for a number of years now at National Caucus and watch you go in the House. So uh, thank you for this important discussion and thank you for your work. And I will continue to support all measures that continue to fight supply chain slavery uh, in China and around the world. Uh, and I will continue to advocate, though, that we need to take action instead of just veiled and, and generality. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Leo. Thanks for the kind words and, and thanks for the great work you do, having been here for, for such a long time and an example to, to me and many others who came in uh, who came in more recently. And uh, and Julie, thanks. again. Well, for, you know, yeah. I, I would I would also say the same thing. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, it's it's for me. It's an important issue. Um, it's it's you know we cannot tolerate violation of human rights. You know, it's it's not right, and we've done it too long. Um, I believe you know, as 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 Leo Sekos was saying, it's a question of money. You know, look those companies who are looking for the lower price for the merchandise. This should not be the only criteria. And obviously, we need some like it because the products are cheaper here, but it's not worth it because on the other side of the ocean somewhere, there's somebody suffering. And to be frank, there is also forced labor, much less, but there is some in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, obviously in, in, in places we don't look, we don't act, we don't, but there are some. So we're not completely, um, I would say, uh, uh, innocent. Uh, it's just that because we, we're richer and we have less quality, we have less. So, mm -hmm. so thank you again, yeah. uh, Garnett. Uh, it's a very nice meeting you. It's the first time we meet because thank we're so far away, the Senate yeah. <laughs> and, and the House of Commons that we never meet. Yes, this is this is one tragedy of the of the renovation, um, among others. But the 
the House of Commons and the Senate used to both meet in center block and now uh, we've moved west and you've moved east and uh, uh, but it, it, you know at the same time we've got these virtual tools and it's great to, to connect with you uh, here. Uh, so so folks, thank you for listening. If you've just encountered this episode, just be aware that we have uh, we do we do weekly podcasts uh, here on resuming debate. Uh, we're going to take a bit of a hiatus in the summer, so we're going to do a couple couple more coming out before the end of June. Uh, then we'll do a, a hiatus in, in July and August, uh, and it'll give you a chance to go back and listen to some of the uh, the, the uh, great earlier episodes, uh, and um, and and also catch up on on uh, some some time with with other things. Um, but it's been it's been great having this this. Uh, platform to, to delve deeper into issues you know we have the uh the, the the short punchy cut and thrust in the house of commons um but to have a podcast where we bring people on from uh from different political backgrounds and, and delve deeper into these issues it's, it's been it's been a lot of fun so so please if you don't already uh, subscribe to the resuming debate podcast you can find it wherever you get your podcast platforms and uh, leave a five-star review and uh and we will be back uh with weekly episodes until the end of june thanks so much Thank you.